Okay, so we are recording. Um, I have been following plastic pollution for years now, and it's crazy how things have kind of grown and developed. I feel like back when I was in school years ago, um, the Pacific Garbage Patch, you know, it was, it was, I don't say a myth, but it was something that like people knew about, but like it really wasn't talked about. Like there was a whole lot of trash in the ocean, but like out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. And here I found you, Josh, you've actually sailed through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which I think is kind of sad that it exists, but really cool that I'm meeting somebody that's actually been there. So um, tell me a little bit about yourself and, you know, about your experience, what you were doing there, how you, uh, what you thought of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, like you said, we were able to sail uh, through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, so I was born and raised in Arizona. Um, I moved to Hawaii about four years ago. And even like you just said, um, just having an idea about plastic, hearing about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So when I moved to Hawaii, especially, it's a very like eco-minded kind of a state. Um, you know, I started really focusing on trying to be using plastics less. Uh, and just like living right next to the water and then seeing trash out in the water definitely inspires you a little bit more. So when the opportunity did come up to kind of be a part of this expedition, the Vortex Swim, um, I definitely wanted to jump on board. Um, so yeah, I was hired to work on the sailboat as a crew member and videographer slash photographer. So we left from Hawaii um, back in June. Uh, we set sail from Hawaii, sailed to San Francisco, and we spent roughly 80 days, or not roughly, we spent 80 days um, out in the water and we sailed roughly 5,500 nautical miles. Um, along the way, we had um, a swimmer. His name is Ben Lacombe. He's done a lot of big open water swims. He swam multiple oceans. He swam from Japan to Hawaii um, on the same kind of sailboat. So they, what happens is every day we would drop him in the water with a dinghy. Two people would be on the dinghy. They'd run a long pole and it would have a string in the, in the water. And that way Ben could be swimming um, basically in the constant right direction because the drivers would be making sure he was staying close and then the sailboat would also stay close. So we kind of wanted to copy that same idea through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So we spent about two weeks sailing out to the patch. It's about a two week sail from Hawaii. Um, and that's kind of when you cross this like imaginary border into the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, so again, we would have Ben uh, swim each day. Um, he would do roughly like six to eight hours of swimming um, in the patch. And what helped with that, um, as far as the research went, was that it just helped us slow down. Um, you know, we were sailing at such a slow speed, so that way we were able to really be studying all these different plastics. We had somebody's eyes in the water all the time, so if there was ever something interesting to find or to, to see, um, we could. So, yeah, the Vortex Swim, 80 days out in the water, we helped Ben swim. I think we conducted, it was 15 different scientific protocols, um, and we studied we studied microplastic, plastic debris um, out in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Wow, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, very impressive that he's able to swim that much and not tire out. Um, yeah, Ben ended up swimming 355 nautical miles. So the goal was 300 and he, he exceeded the 300 mark when we still had weeks to go. So we just kept throwing him in the water and <laughs> the dude loves swimming, so. That's pretty cool. Now, you mentioned there was a whole crew on the boat um, and that you did, um, I guess, research or studies. Did you have um, specific, did you have any scientists on board that were specifically looking at different types or, you know, just you and your crew? So, yeah, there was a crew of 10. Um, one of the guys, his name is Drew. He even lives here in Hawaii with me. Um, he was our onboard scientist. Um, I don't remember all of his credentials, all of his background. I know he's been working as a scientist and he's been studying um, even plastic debris for a long time. Um, so Drew was with us on board. Um, and it was funny because, so we're in a 67 foot sailboat and one of the bathrooms, which, you know, a bathroom on a boat already is super small, but that was redesigned to be a science lab. Um, and I can even try to send you a, a video of that to, that kind of showcases what our small science lab looked like. But like I said, we conducted about 15 different scientific protocols um, all inside that lab. And a lot of things to um, certain net toes or certain fish we would catch, we did um, bag them up, freeze it, and then it's still being studied here on land. And Drew is actually about to start um, kind of working with it. All right, very cool. Now, if um, 
if people wanted to follow that research and see what stuff he collected, obviously I'll ask you later, maybe you can send me um, his page information or whatever, so people, if they're interested, can follow along and see what he found on your trip. Yeah, um, yeah I'm curious to see as well. It, we've been back for a while, but it's been a kind of a slow process to work with some of the things that we brought back. So definitely when that comes out, I will make sure and forward it to you and be posting about it. Cool. Now, um, I, I think a lot of my questions are very basic about your trip. So I'll ask a bunch of my questions and then as fitting, I'll uh, chime in with some of our Instagram followers questions. How did this trip change you? <laughs> I wish everyone could go to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch um, to see what we saw because I think it would change everyone's perspective. Um, especially for so long, it was like 80 days of constantly seeing plastic. There was never a day where we didn't see it. Um, and especially after you just start seeing the way wildlife interacts with it, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. Um, and that, that was really big for me. I love wildlife. If you, you know, I, my favorite thing is to shoot underwater uh, pictures of wildlife. Um, so I think anyone that goes out there, you're going to be changed. Um, coming back home, I think I was just really convicted um, to see, like, we're just this consumer, like, I'm just this consumer that, you know, I never thought twice about some of the things that I'm buying and the reasons why I'm buying them. Um, I always thought trying to go plastic free or, you know, waste free was really difficult. And I think it took me about a week of just looking at some different stores and figuring out the things that I can be buying and making. And um, so, yeah, I mean, my biggest takeaway was just <sighs> seeing how big the ocean is really blew my mind. And then to think that we sailed 5,500 miles and just all along the way, it was just constant plastic um, in every depth level too. Um, 10 meters down, 20 meters down, 30 meters down, there were still microplastics, nets floating, line. It was eye-opening. I can, I can only imagine. You know, I grew up going to the beach on vacations as a kid, and, you know, I don't think I saw that much plastic. And I guess it was a, almost a year ago now, I went out to Long Beach in Huntington Beach, California, and it just made me cry. I'm like, what, what is going on? Like, why? And that, that, you know, I'm not in the Pacific Garbage Patch, but that was for me a big eye opener. I'm like, all right, it is a hard change, but it's something that actually does need to happen. So, mm. um, and it's crazy. Like I was doing so good for a while and now that there's like all of this craziness going on in the world and like grocery stores are empty and I'm like finding myself cringing as I buy stuff that's like wrapped in plastic that I would never normally buy, but have to have food for the week. So mm -hmm. it's tricky. It's tough anyway. because, and I think even like another thing that we talked about a lot is like it's plastic's not the enemy. Like when it com comes down to it, plastic is an amazing invention. And yeah, I mean, you can buy food that is stored in plastic and it will stay fresh for a really long time. Like things like that don't go bad. So, you know, it, it's tough to like be pointing to plastic as like the villain. So I know what you mean. <laughs> Um, so when you were telling me about how you sailed into it, it was kind of like an invisible barrier. Obviously, there's coordinates and it's in like located inside the gyre. Um, when you, I guess when you got there, was there a very specific like, were you just going on coordinates? Hey, we're here. Or did you kind of see a slow accumulation of plastic? Like, describe it, give us a visual. <laughs> Yeah, crossing into like the imaginary border of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch was was pretty wild. Um, along the way, every day we would conduct a net tow. So with that, we would slow the boat down to where we were only moving about a half knot, uh, which is extremely slow. Um, we would drop a net. The net was about a two by two uh, opening. Um, and we would drag that. It would skim just on the surface of the water. And so we would drag that for 30 minutes. Um, once it was done, we'd pull it up and we would sit and hand count, like all of us, we'd all take turns, count all the microplastic pieces that uh, were collected in that 30 minutes. And again, you're only, it's 30 minutes and you're only moving at a half knot speed. Um, and in the beginning, the net toes, it was like 40 to 60 to maybe 80 on like a high day, on like a high day that we were, you know, it was kind of like, oh, wow, you know, the numbers are getting big, the numbers are getting big. And then it was overnight, it switched to the next morning, it was like 500. And then the next day it was a thousand. And then the next day it was 1500. And then a week later it was over 3000. Um, and it was, it was visible. Like you definitely could start seeing more and more and more. 
And then, but I think it was definitely that weird threshold of crossing over that line and really seeing those net toes increase. With all of this floating trash and stuff, you know, there's a lot of um, juvenile animals that, you know, use small little spaces as homes. Did you see a lot of animals, like even small, like little baby fishes, um, you know, kind of like fish use sargasso weed and stuff like that as homes? What did you, did you see animals and stuff? Yeah, surprisingly, there is a lot of wildlife out there for it being just kind of this ocean desert, uh, which is good because it's, you know, it still can be like that's showing a healthy ocean. But I would say for just about every piece of trash that was probably at least more than eight inches, the odds of it having fish living underneath it were really, really high. Um, this um, every big ghost net that we saw always had fish underneath it. Um, and I think one of the really kind of crazy things that we did notice, though, is majority of those kinds of the smaller fish, they were reef fish um, or fish that should be in like coastal waters, not pelagic kind of fish. Um, so it's all this trash and just fish kind of following it for, you know, their life. It's starting to make there's invasive species now out in like the middle of the ocean. Um, and I don't know how that can be affecting kind of like the ecosystem out there, but it, like I'm telling you, like there were fish that I see out here in Hawaii in shallow waters that I saw out in the middle of the Pacific. And it was just like, you don't belong out here. Like you're not gonna, your life is not gonna thrive like it would if you were living on a reef. Cause now they're living inside this ghost net for instance, um, or inside this plastic container um, that's eventually just gonna keep breaking down and breaking down, you know, so it's, it's not the the right life for that kind of a fish. <laughs> I, that's a good point. You know, I, I've seen, you know, like you mentioned earlier, like it's plastic isn't the enemy. You know, there are good sides of having plastic and stuff. And one of the arguments is um, people talking about how the plastic does create like mini or micro ecosystems for these animals. But as you pointed out, that's not where their native habitats are. They should be living on the reef as opposed to, you know, under a piece of plastic trash. Mm -hmm. And I think, just kind of going off that again, it was a dilemma sometimes for us because we would, you know, there were certain times where we would grab a piece of plastic, maybe it was something big, something worth documenting or bringing back on board with us, but it was like we would grab it and we knew that we were also taking that fish's home, for instance, like that's kind of where they lived and it was like, do we take it, do we not take it, like, um, we all kind of concluded that it's best that we do grab it. There's so much trash out there. They will easily go find another piece of trash to be living underneath. Um, and again, just the breakdown of plastics. Like, if we can grab that out, cool. It's not going to be breaking down on them. That's one less, <laughs> you know, piece. That makes sense. Um, so you mentioned ghost nets. And I, I've basically done what I've read, that there are a lot of them out there. What was the piece of trash, um, piece of waste that you saw the most of. Yeah, and also for those that maybe don't know what a ghost net is, a ghost net is basically just this entanglement of line, um, just that's all kind of balled up and come together just through wind and current, and um, it makes this just massive tangled mess that you would probably never untangle, um, and so that's what a ghost net is. A lot of different animals uh, will live inside them, um, but. The most common um, item that we saw and probably the easiest thing to point out were bottle caps. Um, and that was kind of a big surprise to me. Um, but those caps, sometimes um, plastic bottles, they can sink. The, the way their weight and whatever is distributed, they, those can sink down a little deeper, but those caps will always float. Um, and so finding bottle caps was the most common thing that we saw out there. And just like the easiest to, you know, visibly say like, oh yes, that was for sure a bottle cap. You know, we, we would do um, marine debris watches where we would stand on one side of the boat for a half hour and just look out and mark um, things as they floated by. And so you would always be marking, you know, there was a little two inch piece that went by or a six inch and you don't ever know exactly what it was or what it went to, but the bottle caps for sure were the things that you, the most common. Pretty interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. You mentioned like counting trash when I was talking about um, how I visited Huntington Beach. I pulled a bunch of the trash and the plastic stuff um, and brought it back with me. And that's one of the things I'm going to do in this, I guess, plastic, ocean plastics project. 
um, is kind of sit that down in front of a camera and go through it with people and see like, hey, do you recognize this? Like, what can you use to maybe exchange that or replace it with something better? What are your alternatives? Mm -hmm. um, you know, bringing awareness to people. Like, people might not know what a ghost net is, but they definitely know what bottle caps are. Do you have any suggestions for raising awareness? It's definitely hard, yeah, I think for people that live maybe right in the middle of the U.S., for instance, um, who are more landlocked or just, you know, it's. I think it is easy for us here in Hawaii to have an idea or you, because you live in California, you're right next to the coast, so you can kind of see that more. So I know it is tough for people to like resonate with it if they are, yeah, in the middle of the U.S., um, but I think there is there are always ways to be plastic free in certain items. Um, and then I think a really big thing, and especially out here, and you know, hard to say how it is in other states, but just understanding what kind of like um, like legislature, for for instance, out here we just recently passed a bill. Um, it was Bill 40, and it was to basically ban all um, plastic and styrofoam use in restaurants. Um, so that's going to go into effect. I think it was supposed to go into effect later this year in 2020. I think restaurants had X amount of months. Um, obviously, with kind of the way the world's going right now, things like I, I'm, that might change. Um, but that got passed. Um, there was another bill that had gotten passed recently that should be going into effect in another year or two, and it was to uh, ban the use of harmful sunscreens on the reef. So I think just paying attention to like local things like that and helping support that is really big. And I am sure that even states, like I said, in the middle of the US that aren't necessarily next to the ocean, they will still have certain laws like that to get restaurants to be passing bills about not using plastics, um, single use plastics that is. Um, so yeah, I think that's huge. And again, it's just, it's being aware or maybe even just like asking the question. Um, I know it's hard to, it's, it's hard to say like, oh, you know, you need to be raising awareness, but it's, it's trying to also like, just ask some questions. I know it is pretty simple, the out of, out of sight, out of mind. Um, but again, I think what we'll dive into a little bit later is some of the things that we saw out there, they are going to be affecting those even who are landlocked. I think that sums up a good majority of my questions. So we're going to jump into our Instagram questions. Thanks to everybody who submitted these and who've been following this. Um, so this one is from Kat. She wants to know where is it physically located? Why can't we see it on Google Maps, um, Google Earth? And is there something that we can do to make it more visible to the everyday person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can definitely send you an image as well that kind of will help break it down a little bit more. But, and sorry, I'm going to be using my hands, but picture here is Hawaii, here's San Francisco, um, here's California, the mainland. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch sits just about right in the middle of those two. Um, sailing from Hawaii to San Francisco, it's just, it's I think it's just over 2,000 miles worth of a sail. So it's a good eight, uh, like 800 miles or so away from Hawaii. Um, and the way it works too, because it is, it, it, it's ever changing. Um, the way that the winds, tides, currents, all that kind of stuff works, it, it keeps the Great Pacific Garbage Patch together, but it kind of moves it up and down a little bit east, west, north, south. Um, but for the most part, it, it's right in between Hawaii and California. Like I said, I'll definitely send you something. Um, and even when I got back, I was in contact with somebody whose uncle worked for NASA. And I had always heard rumors that like, oh, you can see it, you know, can you see it from space? Like, why can't we see it on Google Images? Um, and I, I followed up with this guy and he did, he confirmed with me that you can't see it from, you know, you cannot see it from space, which again, it was rumored, but it, everyone has heard the stats of like, oh, it's, you know, twice the size of France, it's three times the size of Texas or something random, you know, like it, it's, the, and it's gotten the name, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, like, why can't we see that from space? Um, it's you know it's unfortunate that we can't because I think that would really help sell this the image and the idea a little bit more um, but it's you know there are so many big things but unfortunately now it just seems that everything has broken down so much into the microplastics things that you can hardly hardly see you know you got to be really close to be able to pick it out um, a lot of it has been broken down into that um, and it's it's so spread out I mean the, the distance it's like a thousand miles wide or so um, that there's just like it's everywhere if it were really closely bunched i'm sure then you know we could see it but then we probably wouldn't have that same problem because we could clean it up if for that you know if it were that close together um so yeah unfortunately you cannot see it from space a lot of it's been breaking down <laughs> um 
So here's the question because you mentioned cleaning it up. Um, so let me make sure I've got this right. Uh, the ocean cleanup um, has made big news in the last year, two years um, about going out and cleaning it up. So what do you, how do you feel about the work that they're doing? Do you think that it will have a big impact in the future? Um, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, uh, I was definitely, I, I was kind of maybe on board with being skeptical of the ocean cleanup of like, oh yeah, you know, they, everyone here is, oh, this, these young guys, they have all this money, like what are they doing? Um, and it was really cool because during our expedition, we actually, we were able to meet up uh, with the ocean cleanup and spend a day with them. Um, kind of check out their system. We had some really amazing interviews, got to meet all their, the designers that kind of were designing the systems, the workers that helped work it. We saw a lot of their footage, saw a lot of the trash that they had collected. So now my biggest takeaway is those guys are awesome. And again, those that are on mainland and they want to be able to help, again, it's supporting companies like that. Um, I really do think that, that they are making a change. Um, and even though they don't have the answer yet, um, I think one thing that we talked about is no one else is trying to do it right now and they're going to be the first ones and now hopefully other people will come and want to compete with them um, to be able to clean it up they also need support um, to clean up the ocean like that it's it would take a long time and definitely it would take a lot of money um, but i think it's, it's it is important things to do and again you know you're looking for ways that you can help out and the ocean cleanup i think is a great resource to you know if you want to try to help out support a company i think that they're like a great option um, but yeah, the work that they do is really, really amazing. Essentially, they have designed this system. It's kind of like this U-shaped net um, that it goes opposite of wind and current, so it can tow through the water. Um, and then at the back of this net, they have like a large container that will collect all that trash. So as it moves, things will just kind of like funnel in um, and s slide right back into the net. Um, and I think then a big question is, oh, well, you know, will wildlife get caught in that? Things like that. Um, it's such a loose net and it's also really big. So they aren't collecting things that are the minute, small microplastics. Um, they are collecting the really, really big pieces of trash, kind of in the hopes that, you know, if you can grab this one huge container, that's gonna save the ocean from thousands of smaller pieces of microplastic once that starts to break down. So their big mission definitely is trying to collect all the big stuff. Collecting the little things, I wouldn't even know how to begin doing that, <laughs> you know. Hopefully they figure out another system, but um, yeah, for right now, that's that's kind of what the Ocean Cleanup are doing. It's pretty cool. It's a monumental task that they're undertaking, but like you said, there's nobody else out there doing it, so high five to them. Mm -hmm. um, so... I guess this is kind of along the same lines of that. Obviously, you have hope for his goal. Um, who's, I hate to like put like responsibility on people, but you know, we do need a little responsibility. Whose responsibility do you think it is maybe to help tackle and deal with this problem? Is it government? Do you think it comes down to like us? Do you think it should be divvied out to like the countries where the trash is coming from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you never want to point fingers um put the blame on somebody else because i know it's tough it's i think a lot of americans are like oh well you know our trash you know they say that there's less than this percentage that our trash gets in and look at these other countries and they produce more and um that doesn't matter you know like where is your money going also like are you supporting maybe that other i don't know it's we're all in this kind of thing together um I think it's a bummer because I think a lot of this, the cleanup is put on us and not on the government, for instance. Like, I don't, you know, who knows what kind of funding that they're also doing to help other people. Like, I don't have those kind of answers. Um, but I think it is right now on us even to try to tell that story and kind of like open up the world's eyes to see more. Um, because even, you know, whose fault is it? Like, it's it's really hard to say that it is the consumer's fault because what choices are we given sometimes to buy a certain piece? Um, so I think that even kind of goes back to like, what companies, again, what companies are you supporting? What companies have some decent um, just values or, you know, who kind of cares about some of this stuff? So. You know, you don't ever want to point fingers. I think everyone needs to kind of, you know, do a helping hand and try to help solve this problem. I think a big part of it, though, is um, the companies, the companies that are producing these 
um, these specific items and basically forcing us into only using something that comes in plastic. That's, that's a good point. And you know, like, even if you don't have money to support companies, like we all have a voice. It's because of, you know, our voice that, for example, um, Trader Joe's announced last year that they're going to try and reduce plastic in their stores. And that's, I mean, that's a huge undertaking for the stores, but, you know, they're responding to consumer demand. So, you know, we got to keep getting out there and supporting those companies that have values that we want and, you know, encourage them to do better. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, okay. So obviously single use plastics are really the big culprit, I guess, um, for a lot of day-to-day -day users. What policies or practices can you recommend um, if people want to improve and reduce their plastic? What a policy. Um, I think there's always the easy one of just like, I think having a reusable water bottle is just such, yeah, yeah. I mean, mine's sitting right over here. It's, it's so easy and you end up saving a lot of money. Like I know it's like, oh, this is $30 or whatever, but you'll end up saving way more in the long run. Um, I, what I kind of started doing was just looking at, cause I got back, like I said, from the expedition and obviously I'm changed and I was like, wow, like I need to start you know, re-examining my life and like what plastic items am I using? And I just started breaking down the simplest day to day. Everyone knows about the toothbrush um, of like, oh, you know, you can get the bamboo toothbrush. Okay, well, what goes with that? Like, I need to always have toothpaste. I always need to have like deodorant, for instance, um, toilet paper, <laughs> um, razors, things like that, that I was like, okay, like, let me start doing so. Oh, shampoo, conditioner. Um, just trying to figure out like, okay, these everyday like essentials that, you know, it's like, wow, how could I ever change that? And just looking up to see like, oh my gosh, there are 10 different brands for eco-friendly toothpastes, toothpastes that don't come in in any plastic, um, conditioners, again, that don't come in any plastic. An unfortunate thing is, especially out here in Hawaii, if it's not made here, it's gotta be shipped here. Um, but a lot of those companies, and I could even kind of send you some lists, they will send everything plastic free. It all comes, it'll come in, a paper box, a cardboard box, everything is wrapped in a paper lining, um, everything super eco-friendly, um, you know. <laughs> so yeah, it's just kind of finding those simple everyday items and trying to tell yourself like, okay, like, is there another option? And if you spend two minutes of researching, you will find that there is another option. Um, I think trying to change your whole like life around all at once, that's where it gets really hard. And I think that's even where I was like, I can never do that, you know? But it's just, like I said, I think it took me about a week to figure out how to be very, very, very close to being completely plastic free. Um, there are obviously, like I said, it's kind of comes back to the producers of, I can never, you know, you can't buy oil to run your vehicles and it, that's always yeah. gonna come in plastic. Um, I live and work on sailboats. Um, Boating, you go to any boating store and most everything is in plastic. Um, so that's definitely where, you know, it, it still gets me. Um, but yeah, don't try to like change your entire life <laughs> in like a day. Just start picking out those, the simple day-to-day -day items that you use and trying to figure out what brands offer something different. I like that. That's, that's kind of, I got overwhelmed when I first tried to reduce my plastic and then I was like, no, I'm gonna start day-to-day -day stuff. like. As I run out of something, like as I run out of deodorant, find a plastic free solution for it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I will eagerly accept any recommendations you have. And I'll definitely probably throw them up on my website in addition to um, some recipes, DIY stuff that I've tried at home. Another question, is climate change and the associated storms responsible for more trash washing up or affecting certain areas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, tough question. I'm not, you know, maybe scientific enough to understand all of that. Um, obviously, weather <laughs> plays a really big role. I mean, the fact that we have the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in the first place is due to just the way that weather works. Um, you know, due to climate change, all that kind of stuff, they are finding that there's microplastics as far south as like Antarctica and you know, they're, they're all over the world now. Um, so yeah, I am sure that climate change is playing a role. I don't know what kind of a role, I, I can't answer that. Um, 
but it's I mean that's just like the nature of the world that you know you do there's cause and effect um, I think for everything so any change and something is going to happen due to that. Are there other garbage patches out there? Are they growing at similar rates? Um, like I said this is honestly the only one that I know about that I've heard about but I'm sure if there's one there's probably more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people hear about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that is like the big name. Um, unfortunately, there are five other gyres around the world. Um, they all kind of sit in different oceans. Um, I think I have a map of a few again that I can send you and I don't even know exactly where the other ones are at. I just know that there are five total. Um, I think the Great Pacific Garbage Patch gets a lot of news, especially in the US because it's now it's essentially in our US waters. It's closer um, to the US country. Um, and yeah, it, it is the biggest one. Again, this some of the random, you know, the things you hear, oh, it's twice the size of France. Like, I, I think it was three times the size of Texas. It's, it's massive. Um, and it's, you know, it's even bigger than that. Or there's just, there are millions of pieces of plastic out even outside of that. So it just, it happens to be where all the sneaky plastic gets to. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, okay, so here's another one from Instagram. I've heard that a large percentage of the plastic is made up of microplastic, that it's not um, just the trash that you can see floating on top. I think you've touched a little bit about this, um, and I'm sure this is probably hard for you to answer. Do you know about what percentage of the stuff that's out there is microplastics versus those larger pieces? Mm, yeah, that's... I want to know what kind of a percentage it is. Um, and yeah, I think it is tough because I think a lot of people say like, oh, well, you know, it's all these little small things. Um, I think the small things are worse. Um, if, it, if it's big, it's really easy to collect and grab. And there is plenty of big things. Um, it's hard to like not state that enough to say that like, you know, you everyday sailing out there moving slow it was just constant oh there's a huge container oh there's a huge ghost net you know there there are a lot of big things those are the easy ones to grab um and the easy ones to kind of tell a story about something that's so small it's like well what does it really matter um but now that those things are getting so small and breaking down um kind of the problem with that is now a lot of fish birds all this sea life that those are the things that they're mistakenly eating um the smallest fish Lantern fish will come up at night and feed, um, and it's you know doing studies. We collected a, a handful of those kinds of fish to be dissected again here later on land, uh, but it's you know it's coming back that they, these fish are they are consuming so much microplastic, and again the small fish they're on the very bottom of the food chain. The, you start going up the food chain, and now you get to the fish that we're consuming. Um, so definitely plays a really big problem. Um, just in like the food chain, the breakdown of small things. Um, I think the bummer part of it all is, yeah, everyone wants to see that the epic, that tell all photo, the one drone shot or something that everyone can relate to because you could just see this island of trash. That's what a lot of people like assume the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is. Once you go out there, it's, it's not an island of trash, but it, that shouldn't downplay it um, because yeah. now it's, it's a harder problem to, to tackle um because so much of it is smaller pieces and the term microplastic also just to even kind of help clarify microplastic is something that's less than two inches so a microplastic piece can still be one inch and that's you know it's pretty visible when you're sailing slow and it's you know goes right next to the boat um and I could get you the numbers on the amount of things that we saw doing doing net toes and just looking off the side of the boat um but even though you i say microplastic a lot of it still is just under that two inch you know like oh is it a micro is it a macro you know so yeah <laughs> yeah and hopefully that I'm, glad you, I'm glad you explained that because i've you know i talk about you know plastic trash and microplastics and stuff and i realized that a lot of you know even what i found at the beach that day a lot of it's probably classified as microplastics yeah i think there's a random stat um that says we would the things that we consume at the end of a week we basically eat like a credit cards worth of plastic um, and I don't know exactly how they've done all those studies in but honestly after seeing some of the things that we saw out there and just 
having a better understanding of plastic, we probably are ingesting well over a credit card's worth a week. Um, it, you know, it's look if, if you start kind of even like looking at your kitchen, the your plastic appliances that you're using, um, when that's heated up, that's breaking down. Um, a big one that kind of struck me when we were out there, but something we had studied was just looking at shower curtains. Um, and again, like a shower curtain, it's it's made out of plastic. And when you turn on your hot water and that is hitting the, everything and you're heating up your shower curtain, like you are coming in contact now with that kind of a plastic. And like that is really detrimental to your health that they're kind of now finding out. So like you said, how you mentioned all these different gels and body washes, again, that you're rubbing right into your skin. It's you got to really look at these everyday items that you're using because they're causing a lot of harm right now to people. All right. So let's see. Um, do you feel that it's too late to undo or reverse some of the damage that we have done to the oceans? I don't think it's ever too late, but it just means that we're going to have a harder time and it's going to be longer to, to clean everything up. Um, I think one, you know, one saying that we kind of said a lot out there is if you have a sink and it's broken, the faucet just keeps running water. Don't sit at your sink and try and keep scooping out all the water. You know, you're never going to, that's, you're never going to solve your problem. You need to stop and fix the leak. And that's kind of the same thing with the garbage patch. We can try and collect everything out and it'll help. It'll maybe slow the process down, but that's, you know, that's not where the problem is. The problem is kind of starting here on land. Um, so things need to change again on land to help slow this, <laughs> this huge cleanup mess that we now are, you know, facing. Again, I don't think it's ever too late. And I think right now, kind of where we're at in the world, people are, their eyes are a little bit more open. A lot more people, I would say, know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not too late, but it just means we're going to have a harder time. <laughs> we have a lot of people asking questions about um, the sea life, baby fish, and stuff living in the plastic. So that's mm -hmm. good. Um... Yeah, and even kind of one story on the fish living inside the plastics. Um, there, we have a really good video of it on the Vortex Swim Instagram page. I can, you know, I can try to send you whatever links um, that you might ask for. But we did find um, a frogfish, which again, frogfish, it's a coastal fish. It should live in reef, not in deep, deep, deep waters. Um, and there was one night where we were on the dinghy and we grabbed a plastic water bottle and threw it inside the dinghy because it was just another thing. And then we looked again and there was a frogfish that was living inside of it but basically had grown so big that it couldn't get back out. Um, oh. Like the small hole that it used to be able to probably get in and out of, now it was it was too big. So this fish was stuck in this, you know, tiny water bottle. Um, so definitely life is, they're interacting there. There was one time when we had pulled up um, a medium-sized ghost net um, and they were kind of like digging through it and they found um, a pregnant frogfish and like had all of its babies like right inside this ghost net again which is not the it, that's not where that fish was designed to live and grow so yeah a lot of wildlife interacting with the plastics the biggest um the day that we had our record-breaking net tow when we did reach over 3,000 pieces um that same day was also the day that we swam with sperm whale there was a pod of i think it was about seven that we saw in the water and maybe more and that same day um there was there were dolphins there were two different species of dolphins they were all kind of interacting um there was what we think was an orca out there we saw a, a dorsal fin that can only be in orcas but we didn't see it underwater unfortunately um, so that day there was a lot of hype. There was, you know, there was this really cool story of like, oh my gosh, we just saw this 50 foot or more sperm whale swim by us and its family was down below. And, all. and then we get back to the boat and it was, we had the highest net tow count of the over 3,000. So it's like, it's just this like smack in the face of like, this is their habitat now. Like this is exactly where they're living um, in the dirtiest ocean water you could <laughs> ever picture. That's 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 kind of crushing to hear, like, mm -hmm. like largest biodiversity, boom, here in the highest. Wow. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Sorry, I went on a rant there, but just to kind of oh, yeah. yeah, tell. 
Well, These are the kind of stories that I like to hear. <laughs> Three more questions. All right. Um, so, oh no, we talked about this one. What can we do from landlocked states? That was actually written to us from Sea Life Michigan. Um, obviously, Sea Life, they're a public aquarium that is found around the world. So they, I feel like they have a little bit more voice and are able to reach a little bit more people. Um, so yeah, just, I guess you said, pay attention to stuff that's going on in your community and legislature and, you know, use and, your voice. And I think even kind of what we had said of like, you know, help raise awareness. If it's a company that's like that, they have, I would like to say they have the freedom or the power to be raising awareness because they have, they'll have X amount of people that come in every single day. Now, if they set up, I mean, man, they would be so cool if they would set up a tank that just had just plastics floating inside of it and you know not even any fish but people could walk around and be like oh, what's supposed to be in this tank and it's like oh you know like that's what the middle of the ocean looks like and it's like boom you're starting to raise awareness so it's just kind of come up coming up with ideas like that and again they're a company and they have i would like to say the power to do something like that so yeah. that would be something you know really cool to see <laughs> yeah no absolutely i'll I definitely hopefully they'll watch this and maybe yeah. that's pretty much <laughs> Yeah. Um, actually, there's an interesting, um, art, like I think it's a traveling art exhibit that all the art is made from plastic and stuff that's washed mm. up along the beaches. They have volunteers go out and collect it and they make these really beautiful sculptures and stuff. Um, I think it ended up at one of the AZA conferences last year. So that's hopefully out there raising awareness as well. So I guess if you have any good resources, that you know, if people want to learn more information, or you know, if they want to make plastic choices for the better changes in their life, um, I'd be happy if you know you want to send those to me. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess we'll leave on one last note. Is there anything that you think people should know? If you, if there was one thing you could tell people about your experience about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, what would it be? Specifically about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Or just like a takeaway from the expedition? We'll do, we'll do a takeaway from the expedition. <laughs> okay, yeah. And I, because I think my takeaway, it would just be before the expedition, there was zero thought into what I was buying and consuming. And now it's just like I have a lot more thought. And so I think, again, it's just try to sit down and examine and think about you know, what things are you buying? Where are you spending your money? Like, what? who are you supporting? Um, because again, that that person that's in the middle of the US that doesn't live next to the water, the things that they wanna try to help doing, like that's, that's their way to help. Um, it's just being aware, just having that conscious thought of like, oh, I'm buying this item that is covered in plastic when there's this, you know, that it's not. So I think it's just being aware. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good thing to, be aware of <laughs> yeah, yeah um right. and then even before kind of this wraps up too just one other story um because i don't i i never had a great chance to throw it in um but again those people that are like you know right in the u.s like oh how is that affecting me i live miles away from the ocean um i think a really a big story that happened with us was uh we were fishing while we were out there when you're out in the water for 80 days um you start running out of your fresh food pretty quickly so fish is a great way to kind of help supplement that um, so we would fish, we caught a lot of mahi-mahi, um, and we would always um, dissect the stomachs of each fish that we caught. Um, and inside one of the mahi-mahi, there was a large visible piece of plastic. I'm sure that there was plastic in the other bodies of the fish. Um, again, they're being studied kind of back on land, but there was a really big, it was probably like a one inch by two inch piece of plastic inside the mahi-mahi's stomach. Um, it was kind of this black mesh netting um, is kind of like the best way to describe it. Really sharp, really pointy. And then throughout the expedition, we started finding even, you know, really large kind of rolls of that. So it's just like, oh man, that's going to break down. And, you know, what's to stop another fish from eating it? So I was, um, you know, for instance, I was talking to my parents while we were out there. We had some email communication. Um, and I remember my mom saying that that is really what struck her because like, they live in Washington. They're not in Spokane even where it's like they're even further away, really far away from the ocean specifically. And they are, they felt the same way of like, how do we help? And what does it matter what's happening those thousands of miles away? But even in Spokane, Washington, Costco will sell mahi-mahi. Stores will get, you know, mahi like, 
people are still eating these this these fish that live in those kind of environments. So don't ever think that it it's out of sight, out of mind, because uh, it's not. <laughs> Especially if you're a consumer, it's it's not. So yeah. it's yeah, that's crazy. I've actually been fishing. I used to work as a fisheries biologist out on the lake and we would do a lot of like gut dissections and stuff and I found striped bass with like I, I obviously I didn't see the container but it looked exactly like a cigarette box like the plastic wrappers that it comes in like the same size pulled the whole thing out I'm like oh that's awful yeah and it's awful. like now do I want to be eating this fish that's you know, yeah <laughs> yeah well, thank you so much. If you have any other things that you want to share, feel free to send me a message. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk with me. And this has been very eye-opening for me. And I hope uh, all of the followers as well will see this and, you know, make some changes for the good. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, if any other questions even come out of this, if people leave any kind of just follow-up questions, that'd be awesome to try to help respond. So you guys at home, if you have any questions that are watching, <laughs> um, don't shy away from contacting us, I guess. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you.